Well, hey, before we jump into our passage tonight, I do want to say, as as, uh, regards the next month, we are wrapping up our series on rhythms tonight, which is a study on what are the regular practices for people walking with the Lord to help them become more like Jesus. And then for the month of August, we're going to take a month just to look at the core vision of what our congregation is all about. What What is the vision for Fellowship Mosaic that we believe God has given us to walk in and really to set a trajectory for the next year of where we're going? So I want to invite you. Um, If you call Fellowship Mosaic home, to make it a priority to be with us the next four weeks. I know that there is a lot going on in August. There's back to school things. There's getting one more last more weekend in at the lake. There's the tax-free weekend where you need to shop for 48 hours straight to save as much money as you can. The thing that I love about tax-free weekend is normally if a store posted 10% off everything, we would shrug and go, that's not that great of a deal. But when the 10% is being saved from the government, we're like, I'm going to cash in my 401k and spend it all. So go do tax-free weekend. By all means, do the shopping. But if you can, I invite you, make it a priority to be with us for the month of August as we we walk through what the Lord has for us this next year. I think it's going to be a really important um, season for us. So, hey, let's jump in to this last rhythm of service that we're talking about tonight. And I I think this might be... um, one of the most timely rhythms for us to talk about because we are living through a pandemic right now. And it's not the one that we've been talking about. It's not the one that's been in the news as much. When we say the pandemic, we have one thing that comes to our mind, but there's another one that concerns me maybe even more. And it is the pandemic that we have seen over and over again of stories of abuse coming out in churches and Christian organizations. Um, It seems like about monthly, a new story breaks, a new report about abuse and cover-up. I'm not going to list statistics or reports here, because then you might get the idea that I'm picking on that particular church or that particular denomination. It's everywhere. It's, It's across the board that we are seeing how much Christian organizations and churches have a problem with abuse of power and hurting people and covering it up. And it's, I mean, I've gotten to the point where I can't really even tune in anymore because there's another podcast, another documentary series, another news article coming out about this. And I think, I think that's necessary work. Like, I think we need to expose where abuse has taken place and we need to address it and have accountability. And most of the studies and conversations that I've heard going on focus on two aspects. One is holding abusers accountable and helping victims heal, both of which are crucial, important work. But there's a third aspect that I've heard remarkably little discussion around. And it is the question of what has broken in our Christian discipleship that this is happening in the first place. Yeah, it's absolutely necessary to do care on the back end. That's crucial. But I also want to know what's happening in our understanding of walking with Jesus that this becomes such a prevalent thing? How did we get to a place where the idea of power and bullying and abuse is something that we're so little bothered by? Several years ago, there was one particular pastor who, um, there, there was a report done where it came through just example after example after example of him being a bullying, abusive, manipulative tyrant to everyone on his team. And when they brought that out to the church, they said, we see all these patterns, and yet we don't think he's disqualified from leadership. And that just struck me as odd. What is going on in our understanding of Christian leadership that we can list that kind of leadership behavior and then say, not disqualifying for leading? What's gone wrong? What is in the heart of our understanding of power and leadership and influence that this pattern is repeating so often. And what has Jesus given us to address it is the question that I've been wrestling with and I wanna invite us to wrestle with tonight. And whenever we talk about any pattern of brokenness in the world, the immediate answer is always the, the problem is sin. The problem is sin in the human heart. So what particular kind of sin? What's going on here? And there's, there's a a pattern in the New Testament of defining the breakdown of sin and temptation. One of the most clear articulations for it happens in John's first letter. Uh, John wrote a letter to a church about living in a fallen world, and this is what he said. He said, do not love the world 
or anything in the world. And when he says the world here for John, that means particularly the unbelieving world. Don't love the powers of the world that are warring against Jesus. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And for centuries, as Christians have read this description of sin and temptation, they've they've recognized three basic sources of temptation. And many have suggested that really all sin can be broken down to one of these three. A temptation for physical pleasure outside of how God has designed it to happen. A desire for materialism or pretty shiny things outside of what God has blessed us to have. Or a desire for pride and power outside of what God has given us. That this obsessive pursuit of pleasure, wealth, and power is at the heart of our struggle with sin. And that every temptation can ultimately be drawn back to one of those three. I I was working through a book by a guy named Andy Crouch called Culture Making, and it's talking about how the Christians engage the culture. And he suggests that in the last 50 years or so of the, the church in America, we have done a great job preaching against the temptation of physical pleasure. We preach against sexual sin all the time. We preach against substance abuse and how damaging that is. We've done so-so on preaching against greed and materialism. He said he rarely hears churches talking about the temptation of pride and power and significance. In fact, if we were to watch the behavior of our churches, one could suggest that we've actually cozied up with pride and power and significance and started to see that as a means to honoring God rather than a a potential source of temptation. This pattern we see go all the way back to the book of Genesis when the first temptation came to Adam and Eve in the garden. They're sitting in a place where God has provided everything they need and a serpent comes up and he begins to, to tempt Adam and Eve with the fruit that God said wasn't for them. And look at what Eve saw was attractive about the fruit. The fruit was good for food. That's your pleasure, taste. It was pleasing to the eye. It was pretty and shiny and we wanted it. That's our materialism. And desirable for gaining wisdom. This spoke to the pride and significance. And at the heart of that temptation was a little carrot that the serpent dangled out in front of Adam and Eve. What was waiting for them if they chose to eat this fruit? The promise was that if they ate it, they would be like God. And there is this temptation in the heart of people to leave our place as servants of God and instead to be gods all to ourselves. And I think it is a temptation that is particularly prevalent for us in the West. It's even been enshrined in in some of our legal rulings. This is one of, I think, one of the most interesting quotes that I've ever read come out of our legal system. Look at one of the, the reasonings behind a big Supreme Court ruling. At the heart of liberty, freedom, what we love, is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of life. Who gets to define the concept of existence, meaning, the universe, and the mystery of life? That's a God, right? But think about that statement. At the heart of what it is to be free is the right to be a God to yourself, to decide for yourself how reality works, and that no one else has that power over you. This is the air we breathe. These are the waters that we swim in. And I think we have to be aware of the temptation and the draw that it has for us. So with that in mind, let's take a look at this story in Mark chapter 10 to look at how Jesus confronted this pattern and this temptation in his followers. The context of the story is Jesus has just finished telling his disciples that he's gonna die. He's on his way to Jerusalem 
And they've been doing ministry up in the north, which it's way out in the middle of nowhere where they've been working. Like there's nothing significant happening. And now he gathers them up and he says, it's time to go to Jerusalem. Um, in, in like the political climate of, of this moment, it would be like if somebody's been preaching, I don't know, in the middle of nowhere, like Arkansas. And then they say, hey, we've scheduled a big event in D.C. He's saying, we're going to the seat of power. And so Jesus gathers his disciples and they start going to DC, to DC of the day, to Jerusalem. And he tells them, hey, I'm actually going there to die. And apparently they aren't listening at all because right after he tells them that and they're walking to Jerusalem, listen to what James and John say. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's an amazing request. And Jesus answers, what do you want me to do for you? Do you hear the wisdom in Jesus here? Every parent has to have learned this lesson at some point when a kid walks up and says, hey, will you do me a favor? What is the answer? What's the favor? You do not say yes to that question without more information. The disciples come out and say, hey, we want you to do something for us. And Jesus goes, what would you like me to do? Please unpack it more. And they say, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. They're picturing the moment because he's going to Jerusalem and what's supposed to happen in Jerusalem is that's where the king of Israel is crowned. And they know that Jesus is presenting himself as the promised king. So he's about to get a throne. This is the moment they've been waiting for. And they're trying to lobby for their position next to Jesus. This is a really common temptation. If we can't be the most important person, then let's at, less, at least try to be really close to the most important person. One of the, the more humiliating moments, I've got a lot of them, but one of my more recent really humiliating moments was we were at, I'll be as vague as I can on this to not incriminate too many people. I, we were at a, an event, a thing, and there was a person of large cultural power and significance at this event. And they gathered everyone up for a group photo. And... Cassie and I are standing next to each other in the group photo, and I look over and realize that about 10 feet away is this person of great significance and no one standing in between us. And I mean, at a subconscious, nonverbal level, I felt the intense draw to be standing next to that person for the group photo. And so I had my arm around Cassie, and I start scooting us over. (laughs) And as I start scooting, as I'm pulling, Cassie trips and I bend over right as they snap the picture. (laughs) So instead of my glorious photo next to the important person, we're actually not in the photo at all. And I thought to myself, God has the most wonderful sense of irony. Do you feel that? Do you feel the moment, the, the, the draw to be next to the important person? To elevate your own sense of significance by your proximity to other significant people? In this moment, Jesus and John, or James and John are beating the other 12 to the punch. Up to this point, the 12 have been serving alongside each other, and James and John see an opportunity as they're on their way to Jerusalem to cut in line, to carve out their space before anyone else. And Jesus looks at him and says, you don't even know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. Uh, the term baptism, we, we have religious association with it because of the history of the church where baptism has become particularly, I'm gesturing for baptismal, something that we do to identify with Christ. But the word in the first century was a much more generic term for being immersed or dunked in something. Like you would, if you were washing clothes, you would baptize them in the tub. That just meant being dunked down. So he's saying, can you drink the drink I'm about to drink and you, can you be immersed in what I'm about to be immersed in? Now, this sounds really vague, but what has he just told them is about to happen? He's going to Jerusalem to die. They're thinking about power, and he's contemplating the cross. And he says, can you step into what I'm stepping into? And they say, we can. And Jesus said to them, well, actually, you will. You're going to experience what I'm going to experience. You are going to suffer. You'll drink the drink I drink, the baptism I'm baptized with. It is true that you are going to suffer for me. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. 
These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. We're going to come back to that idea in a minute because that seems really vague and mysterious to me. But he looks at James and John and says, you absolutely are going to follow me and you are going to experience the suffering I'm going to experience. But this thing you've asked for, this pride and position at my right and left, it's not for you. It's not even for me to grant. And then, no surprise, verse 41, when the other 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Now, perhaps they had such humble hearts that they couldn't believe the arrogance of James and John to ask such a thing. I'm more inclined, based on the disciples' patterns in the rest of the Gospels, to think they're really mad that James and John thought of it first. And they're furious that they tried to cut in line. So now, again, think about this moment for Jesus. He's just told his best friends, I'm about to suffer and die. And they're all fighting each other over who's in the most important place. So Jesus, the ever patient teacher, calls them together and says, hey, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. He's saying this is how leadership works out in the world. People are given authority and power, and they hold on to that privilege to hold it over people who are lower than them. And they force their will onto others. Jesus says, hey, you know what? I get it. That's that's the way it works out there. That's the way people do leadership. But he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Why? Because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Now, it's become really trendy to talk about servant leadership in the world today to take this cue from Jesus about what does a a leader do? They should serve the people around them. And that's absolutely true. And by all means, people in institutional leadership should learn about leadership from Jesus. But Jesus is not simply giving us a pattern here for how to be a good boss or a good school administrator. Because when he says not so with you, he's talking to all of his followers To seek greatness by serving is not just a leadership strategy. It is a discipleship strategy. It is a message for what it means to be a person who follows Jesus. That our way of life is not to be seeking power and significance over others, but rather to be looking to how we can serve others in all things. And somewhere along the way, Instead of letting Jesus teach us how influence works, we got our wires crossed and have started letting the non-believing world teach us how influence works. Several years ago, I was speaking to a Christian leader, and this is someone that I respect in a lot of ways, but they, I was talking to them about leadership and, and wanting to grow in leadership, and they said, look, a leader is a person who imposes their will on others. They don't wait for people to get on board. They make things happen. Because if you're not, this is the phrase, sorry for the crassness, if you're not the lead dog, you'll spend your life sniffing someone else's butt. Something just like curdled inside me when I heard that. Somewhere along the way, we bought into the idea that the way to influence people, even for good causes like ministry and the gospel and the church, was to be powerful and strong and imposing and to force people to align with our will. And yet, Jesus' model of influence is not to get over people so that you can have strength to impose on them, but rather to get lower so that you're constantly serving them. That's that's one of the reasons I know I go here a lot. That's one of the reasons I am so concerned about when the church mingles its mission with the mission of politics because the means of influence in politics is power and imposing will. And when we reach for that lever to change the world, 
I think there's a draw there that is deadly dangerous. Now, I can imagine, especially with all the conversations around abuse and depression, some of you might be saying, whoa, 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 whoa. This idea that we should be servants to everyone, isn't that actually going to be used to make powerful people oppressive? If you tell a bunch of people, go out there and be servants, doesn't that just make them vulnerable to abuse? To the next really powerful person? It is really important to understand what Jesus means by being a servant and what he does not mean. There there is some language going on here that's really crucial because one of the things that will develop in the history of the Christian faith is there is only one Lord for all of us, and that Lord is Jesus. We see no other master than Jesus. And so the kind of oppression that we see so often is when any one person raises up and says, I am your master, all of you have to follow me. Another danger is a kind of codependency where I desperately need somebody else's approval to make me feel significant, so I tell them, you are my master. I will be controlled by what you want. I will be controlled by you feeling pleased. I will be controlled by whatever you ask of me. Now, oftentimes, in our culture, to avoid these extremes of oppression and codependency, we'll come up with a new answer of Western individualism that says, I'm my own master. No one can tell me what to do. I'm the master of my own fate. And we've set ourselves up as little gods. Instead, Jesus proposes something radically different than all of those. He says that he is our only master, and he calls us to serve others. Which means those people that we are serving don't get to be our masters and tell us what to do. They are not the ones from whom we take our orders We take our orders from the king. So when Jesus sends us out to be servants to all, he's not sending us out to be enslaved by all. Rather, we are only servants to him and him alone. And when we love and serve other people, we're taking our orders from Jesus. And that's what protects us from any idea that we should receive abuse or maltreatment from other people. This pattern of receiving direction from Jesus and setting ourselves in the posture of servant is given to war against the desire for pride and significance that goes all the way back to the garden. That is why service is listed as a rhythm for the Christian. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's certainly about loving others, but it's also about us growing. Choosing to humbly serve actually changes me. Choosing to put myself in a lower place actually makes me more like Jesus. And it refuses, when we see Christ as our master, to let ourselves be mastered by anyone else's opinions of us. When two humans have that relationship over each other, it's destructive. But there is a kind of relationship between an owner and an owned that is really productive and healthy. And it looks kind of like this guy. This is our dog, Axe. He's the best. We have loved every bit of survival instinct out of him. He cannot go to sleep at night unless he has a fleece blanket to lay on. Okay? Now, there is no doubt about the fact that we have an unequal relationship. We are Axe's owners, and he is our pet. And that disproportionate relationship is arranged for his good. We want to see him thrive The other day, he ate something and had a bacteria in his stomach. We took him to the vet. It was $500, and we paid it without blinking because we love that little turd, and we really want him to be... I said turd. (laughs) Yep. We really want him to be healthy and thrive, and we'll do just about anything to make it happen. That relationship is only appropriate when the two beings are of completely different status. The only one who has that status over us is God himself. We are absolutely owned by God. The the followers of Jesus in the New Testament have no problems. We soften it 
and say servant in our New Testament. But if we were translating it really roughly the way it comes across in Greek, it would be slave. That I am a slave to Jesus Christ. And he is my owner and my master. When that relationship happens between two equal people, it's oppressive and destructive. When that relationship happens between a God who loves us for our good, it sets us free to be the people God made us to be. So what does it look like to actually step into a life of service? To choose to recognize God as our master so that we don't need significance and can actually begin to love and serve others. Can I give just a couple of examples of what some service has looked like around here? Uh, uh, several years ago, this was actually right after our daughter was born. Um, Cassie was having some health issues and I was just drowning in life and struggling to keep up. And the first sign that things are broken in the Roland household is that our lawn gets overgrown. That is the first thing to go every time. And I came home from work one day and our, our lawn was completely mowed and it looked beautiful. I was like, oh man, I wonder who did that. And I started going into investigator mode, trying to figure it out. And I couldn't find the person. It's like, what a gift. A week later, it happened again. And then again, and then again. And I was asking around, trying to figure out who was doing this. I could not find who was mowing our yard. And then one day, I think I had left something at home. So I came home from work at a weird time and I saw the truck and the trailer I saw the mower moving, and when I pulled in, they stopped the mower and jumped off and hid behind our house. <laughs> and I walked around the corner, and I found Luke Pasco, who is a college student, he's a member of our body now, who had been mowing our, our yard all summer. And he said, I never, I never wanted you to know it was me. I just wanted to love you guys well. Another example comes from one of our elders, who is in a position of leadership over this body who we all look to for direction. When we're facing big, significant questions for this church of where we're going, we are looking to this group of people to guide us. And, and Scott Thompson will go from elder meetings where he's praying and working through huge issues to serve on Saturday night teaching preschoolers the Bible and literally was teaching on John chapter 13 of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And I, remember, I was sitting in the room watching that happen. And for him, it was a teaching illustration just to show preschoolers what washing feet looked like. But in the moment, I realized that is this man's life. That is what he lives and models for every one of us. Those are the kinds of people that we follow here. Our, our uh, mosaic team one, I think once or twice a year goes to the elders and just kind of gives an update. And I remember the first time that Kyle Jackson, after he had joined the team, went, we sat and met with them for a half an hour, talked through different things. They prayed for us. And Kyle just walked out and said, I wish that every person at this church could just come spend a half an hour with them and get to see the humility in the heart of the people leading us. Humble service shapes our heart to be more like Jesus because that's how Jesus lived his life. So the challenge for us is what intentional rhythm of serving will you choose? Humble service like that doesn't happen by accident. Scott committed to be there every week with those kids. Luke chose every week to make a rhythm and a habit of coming and serving me and my family. So in our choosing of habits and rhythms to transform us and make us like Jesus, the invitation this week is choose to serve. Choose a pattern of serving. I'm gonna suggest three options and challenge you to pray through this week. What would it look like for the fall to commit to one of them? One of them would be to serve right in your own context where you are. Maybe that's a, a, an act of service in your family. Maybe it's your neighborhood, your workplace, your kid's school. Where is a place that you can choose to serve in a way that brings you under, brings you lower than someone else and doesn't bring attention to yourself. The other would be to jump in somewhere this fall here at the church. We gave you like, literally 50 options a little bit ago. What would it look like just to commit to one of them for the fall and say, I'm gonna jump in and serve there. And then finally, in outreach ministries, we have several ministries we partner with. Most significantly is Samaritan Community Center. who It's about to get as easy as possible in September when their ministry moves on to our campus. 
And we're going to be telling you about it. That, uh, we'll, we'll let you know as soon as we can. There's going to be an open house for people who attend fellowship to go just walk through, see all the opportunities, and see how we can get involved. Um, I would love it if we could flood the outreach ministries of Northwest Arkansas. One of our core values around here for a long time was been that we want our fingerprints to be everywhere and our name to be nowhere. And I was talking to a friend who was trying to find a church in Northwest Arkansas. And while they were waiting, they just started volunteering at different service places. And everyone they loved, they thought, this place is amazing. Which church is backing it? And they say, oh, we're independent of any churches. And they couldn't get an answer. And so they said this happened over and over again. They pointed and said, okay, fine, you, where do you go to church? And they said, oh, well, well, I go to fellowship. And he looked at me and said, he said, it is like you have people sprinkled all over Northwest Arkansas, but I can't find your name on any of the buildings. That is the vision for what we want our church to be. A church that is launched to serve Northwest Arkansas and the world with the love of Jesus. It'll bless the world, but the surprise, the thing that God has for you and me is not only will it bless them, it'll transform us into the kind of people who don't seek power and significance, but seek greatness in the kingdom of God through serving others. As we continue to sing, we're gonna take communion. I'm gonna invite you to come down. We'll ask you to come out to the left, take the elements and go back to your right. I said earlier, we'd come back to that idea of who gets to sit on Jesus's right and left. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. And one commentator suggested, when they said, we wanna be on your right and left in your glory, they had in mind a palace. But Jesus knew his most glorious moment would not be a throne on a palace, it would be a cross. And the people on his right and left would not be the disciples, but it would be criminals and thieves. And that he looked at James and John and said, you have no idea what you're asking. It is in the cross of Jesus where he shed his blood for our sins that we saw what true service looks like. So let's remember that in gratitude tonight. Come on down and receive the elements, hold on to them, and we'll take them together in a moment.